Welcome again to a red letter revolution. Red letter because all through 2012 we're studying the words of Jesus out of the gospel of John. And revolution because anytime you give your full love to Jesus, he floods you with his love as well. It's going to be an unbelievable year. If you're just joining us online or in one of the campuses, I'm Dan Sutherland, one of the pastors here. Welcome. Find your notes and wave them at me. Wherever you are, there are notes available. They're available online. There's a button there where you can grab them and pull, <coughs> excuse me, and pull them in. We are purpose-driven note takers. Men, you especially need to take notes. Can I prove it to you? How do you do when the wife sends you to the grocery store for a few things and you forget the list? Not good. This leads to many second trips to the store. Write it down. Write it down. Write it down. It sticks in our heads. We're in a series called Knowing Jesus. Not knowing about Jesus, knowing Jesus. And we talked about it last week. If you weren't here, I encourage you to go online and listen to that particular teaching. We're studying through the Gospel of John this year, and we're asking three questions. First things for you to write in your notes. Are you ready? We're asking, who is Jesus, not who was Jesus. That question ticks me off. He's not a was. He's an is. He's not dead. He's alive. He didn't used to speak. He still speaks. And that's why we're also asking, what does Jesus say? Write that in your notes. And what does Jesus do? We're basing this concept off of a truth out of the book of Hebrews that tells us Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So here's the big idea for this series. Write it in your notes. Knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing Jesus. We talked last week about the fact you can miss heaven by 18 inches by what you know about him here, by versus how you really know and love and follow him here. We don't want that to happen. We want to emphasize knowing Jesus all through the year. So here's the premise. Write it in. As we see who Jesus is and what he says and does in the Bible, we will also know who Jesus is and what he says and does today. When we see who he is, what he says, what he does in this book, 2,000 years old, yes. But the cool part is that Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. So if I see what he did here, guess what? I will know what he's doing today. Same God, he hasn't changed. Same Jesus, he hasn't changed. Same answers, they haven't changed. Last week, we talked about Jesus is God. Here's where we're going this week. Point number one, Jesus is creator. Jesus is creator. Now, technically, I ought to have put co-creator with the Father and the Spirit, but that was too long for a blank. But that is the case. He's co-creator. You got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit all playing a role in creation. Now, many of us, we just think God created the heavens and the earth. That's all good. And we tend to think that's a God the Father kind of thing. Scripture tells us clearly, all three involved in creation. You're going, what's the difference? By the second half of the teaching today, you'll see there's a huge difference. Let's walk our way through it. John 1, 1, we covered one verse last week. We're getting all the way up to three verses today. Whoa, that's fast. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Pause here. You remember last week, we talked about the Word is John's way of describing Jesus. When we get down to verses 12, 13, and 14 here in a few weeks, you'll see that connection. If you want to read ahead, you can see it today as well. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Circle that word, nothing. You remember that Greek word for all in the New Testament? Testament that means all? Well, this is the Hebrew word for nothing in the Old Testament. Anybody want to guess what it means? Nothing. That's what it means. Absolutely nothing. No exception. Jesus was part of all of creation. God the Father didn't create Jesus. 
He was part of creation. He was co-creator. Now, when John is writing his gospel, you remember who John is? He's the teenage disciple, the guy that was probably 14, 15, or 16 when he was following Jesus. Is that an amazing thought? One of the 12 was 14, 15, 16 years old. He's now the last living guy as he writes parts of the New Testament. He writes this book. And while he's writing John, he has Genesis in his other hand. He's got access to the Old Testament that's already been codified and put together. So when he writes, in the beginning was the Word, don't miss the connection to the first part of Genesis 1, which reads, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He's making a connection here, Jesus and creation. He's saying Jesus was part of creation. He's also making a connection by calling Jesus the Word. Do you remember in Genesis 1 how God created the world? It says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke the world into existence. He spoke it into existence. God said, let there be water, and there was ocean. God said, let there be animals, and there were animals. He spoke it. So when Jesus is the Word... Do you see the connection again in creation? He is part of that. But there's another connection here that is an amazing one, a mind-blowing one. We see Jesus connected in the creation of man himself. Listen to this verse, Genesis 1, 26. Everything else, God spoke it into existence, no commentary, no anything else, moving along. And then he gets to man and woman, and here's what God says. By the way, God talks to himself here. It's one of the few places in Scripture where it happens. There's some of you going, big deal, I do it all the time. I'm actually capable of having a, a conversation with myself. I can ask the questions and answer them and then debate the answer. Anybody else able to do all three? That's what's going on here. It's called schizophrenia for you and I, but it's called part of being God for the Trinity. Look at what it says. Then God said, let us. Do you see that us? Circle us. Let us make mankind in our, circle our, image in our, circle our likeness. It's plural. It's plural, guys. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, all involved in creation. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, by the way, that, that last line is one of my favorite lines in all of Scripture. Male and female, he created them. If it had just been male, shoot me now. I mean, guys, we'd be one old, dugly, quite a bit calmer world and that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> so you got Jesus in the Old Testament as part of creation. And then you got Jesus in the New Testament, again, as part of creation. Look at what 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says. But we know that there's only one God, the Father, who created everything, and we live for him, and there's only one Lord, Jesus Christ, don't miss it, through whom God made everything and through whom we've been given life. He is the co-creator. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. We even see it in the end time, says Dan, who nearly fell on Troy's guitar stuff. We even see it in the end times. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, who, by the way, this same young disciple John wrote. Interesting, John's gospel being written from the youngest disciple point of view and the last book of the Bible being written by this same young writer who's now probably in his 70s, maybe even his 80s. He's old when he's writing this. He's describing heaven. The book of Revelation is basically a vision of the end times and a vision of heaven. And in this picture in John 4 and 11, Jesus is sitting on the throne of heaven and the angels are gathered around worshiping Jesus. Notice the words they use. You are worthy our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things. 
and by your will they were created. Jesus in the Old Testament story of creation, yes. In the New Testament account, yes. In the heaven account, yes. Here's the point. Write it in. We'll come back to it at the end of our teaching today. Creation was a team effort. The God who exists in community, think about it, Father, Son, and Spirit exists in community, also created in community, all three apart, and then he placed us in community. He made us male and female. If you want a summary statement for all of that, God screams community. He exists in community, he creates in community, and he places us in community. And yet so many of us are still trying to do the I'll follow Jesus thing solo. No. Creation is a community effort. Jesus is creator. Now, I'll remind you one more time, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. If Jesus is the Savior of our sins and he's the same, then he's always saving us from our sins. If Jesus is the ruler of the universe, then he's always the ruler, always ruling the universe. And if Jesus is the creator, then guess what? He is also the re-creator. Write that in your notes, point two. This is where it gets good. This is where it gets personal. He's the re-creator. He's still creating us. Look around the room. Nobody in this room is done yet. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Nobody's done yet. He's still recreating. Look at Ephesians 2.10. We've talked about this verse last week. I want to stretch it out, do a little more with it this week. For we are God's masterpiece. Would you circle masterpiece? I got to tell you guys, I love so many things about Kansas City, but one of the confusing things when I first got here is I'd go to the grocery store with my list from my wife, and it would say, barbecue sauce. There's 56,000 kinds of barbecue sauce in this town. Seriously, have you stood on the aisle at Price Chopper? I mean, they got a whole aisle that says barbecue sauce. The whole aisle. I mean, it's, it's craziness. And I'm standing there going, what do you get? What do you do? And I mean, I've tried them all. Let me give you some biblical advice. Go with the barbecue sauce that is biblical. It's called Masterpiece. <laughs> I mean, we might as well be biblical in our sauce. We are God's masterpiece. We talked about this last week. That means you're God's painting. You're God's drawing. You're God's poem. You're God's short story. God is still drawing you, painting you, writing you, creating you. And he has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Jesus is not just the creator. He's the recreator. He's the God of second and third and tenth and 49th chances. And I need them all. Because he recreates, and he keeps growing, and he keeps working, and he keeps making us like Jesus. Look at the next verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Now, I don't do this often, but I want to talk about Greek grammar for just a minute. Yes, I know a little Greek. He runs a deli down the street from my house. But I'm bumps. Thank you very much. Be here all week. Tip jar in front. <laughs> it is rare that I jump into talking about the original languages of the Old and New Testament, except to kind of make fun at it and say that Greek word all means all, and that Hebrew word nothing means nothing, because I believe fully God speaks any language you speak. You speak Swahili, God's better. You speak, you speak Texican, God speaks it better. Whatever your language is, God speaks it, and you don't have to be a biblical language scholar for the Word of God to make sense because you've got the Spirit of God living in you, and God speaks your language, and He can make it clear. I believe that. I also believe there are moments where pulling just a little bit of insight out of the original language is worth doing. This is one of those moments because we're going to run into this again and again and again in the Gospel of John. Write this in. In Greek grammar... The present imperative is a verb tense, a verb form that means do this and keep on doing it. In the Greek grammar, in the Greek language, 
there's a thing called present imperative. It's a verb tense, a verb form that means do this and keep doing it. We don't have that in English. We don't have that imperative present tense form. So sometimes what is said, particularly in the Gospel of John, who uses this verb form a lot, doesn't come through with quite the boom that it ought to. Let me give you some examples. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, ask and you will receive. You know what the Greek verb tense, that present imperative really is saying? It really says, ask and keep on asking and you will receive and keep on receiving. Does that make a little difference? It's not a one-time ask. It says in that same verse that you should knock and the door will be open. But literally, it's present imperative. It's knock and keep on knocking and the door will open and it will be keep being open. God will keep answering your prayer. He'll keep opening the door. The same verse says seek and you will find. It literally means seek, but you got to keep on seeking and you will find God, but you'll also keep finding him. Do you see the difference? That does not exist in English, but it is what is used many times when it talks about God being the recreator, the one who creates and keeps on creating. So let's read that verse we just did in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, which is present imperative, and let's read it, and I have put in parentheses my additional paraphrase of what that would mean if we had this verb tense in English. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ and stays in Christ, he is and will continue to be a new creation. Old things have passed and will continue to pass away, and all things have become and will continue to become new. Wow! It's a huge deal. Let me give it to you. As I keep following Jesus, write this in, he keeps on making me new. I need this. There's still hope for those old habits. He's still making me new. There's still hope for that old stuff I bring back and do from time to time. He's still working on me. Jesus wants, write this in, to keep on recreating me as I stay in him. Are you hearing this is good news? He's still working on us. I love the fact that at Westside, we believe in elementary kids and we believe in middle school and high schoolers and we believe in preschoolers enough that we do our own ministry to them. Preschool and elementary right now, while parents are in this room, are able to be over there getting their own stuff. Second graders are getting second grade level stuff and four-year-olds are getting four-year-old level stuff. There's a preschool song, though, that I think has probably got adult level truth right here goes like this. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How awesome and wondrous I must be because he's still working on me. Oh, thank you very much. May you always be in the present imperative, cheap and easy like you are now, <laughs> as an audience. Did you catch it? The God who spoke this world into existence in seven days says, you're such a masterpiece, he'll still working on you. He's got a big picture of you. He's got big plans for you. He's not tired of you like you are. He hasn't quit on you like you have. He's not down on you like you and I can get down on us. No. Here's two pieces of great news. Would you write them in? God is not finished with me yet. He's not done. This meal is still being prepared. This prize is still being developed. 
This person is still being made. And I love this last one. What I am today is not the final version of me. Uh Uh-uh. No, no, no. There's a better husband in here. And as I let Jesus extract Dan Sutherland and put the new Dan Sutherland with Jesus' DNA inside, that better husband steps up. And as I let him pull out the old Dan Sutherland and put the new one in, that better dad steps up and that better person steps up. And it's not because I'm doing better. It's because I'm doing less. And he's doing more. The God of creation is still recreating you, church. That's why Jesus being co-creator is such a big deal. Because it's the truth that lets us know he's also the re-creator. I've put a bunch of verses in here. We're doing this every week. I hope you take advantage of them. Study more. Dig more. If you want to read more on creation and Jesus as creator and Jesus as the recreator, I've put some verses in there in a specific order to weave a bit of a trail through that adventure. More study for you here. I hope you'll take it and do it this week.